So far, we've been working under the assumption that changes in government expenditures and taxes must be fiscally neutral. That is, there are no government deficits or surpluses. If the government were to spend more than what it would collect as tax revenues, it would have to raise the extra funds to make good on its creditors. This is typically done by issuing bonds. This is the typical look of a government bond, in this case for the Commonwealth of Australia Treasury. It entails a number of elements that are informative with regard to its properties. First, the principal. As you can see, in this case, the bond was sold by 20 Australian dollars at a contracted annualized rate of 5.25% of interest. The maturity, that is, the date at which the principal must be reimbursed to the bond holder, was set to be on November 15th of 1987. The interest was to be paid twice a year in exchange for each of the coupons that are shown below. The popular zero coupon bond is a bond where both principal and interest are paid back at maturity. In the UK, the total amount of outstanding bonds for the government has fluctuated a lot since the beginning of the 18th century. But typically, periods of very high debt were associated with wartime periods. During the Second World War, public debt reached 250% of GDP. Looking at 2016, and excluding countries with less than 1 million inhabitants, Japan had the highest debt in percentage of GDP of the whole world, with 222%. Greece, Lebanon, Italy and Portugal followed with debts in excess of 130% of GDP. On the opposite side, countries with the lowest debt ratios to GDP were found to be in East Timor, with no outstanding debt at all, Libya, Afghanistan, Estonia and Russia these at or below 10% debt over GDP. Too much debt certainly entails very high burdens with debt servicing, the amount of resources that every year must be used to pay interest. In Portugal, around the times of the sovereign debt crisis in the early 2010s, debt service was close to what the Portuguese government was spending with the entire national healthcare or education systems. However, too little debt might also be a symptom not of fiscal responsibility, but rather of the lack of institutional credit on the markets, markets that are not willing to lend money to these economies. When looking at debt over GDP as a metric for the size of debt in the given economy, it is worth noting that the ratio can change, not just as debt changes, but also as a function of output dynamics. Here, we can see how Portugal in the 1990s was on a convergence path to the most developed economies in the European Union, being comparably poorer but growing faster, as the solo model would predict. However, we fast forward to the 2000s and Portugal stopped converging. The European Union as a whole slowed down to just 1.72% of real GDP growth per capita, but Portugal almost stopped, with an average growth rate in the decade of less than half a percent. This has very strong implications for debt sustainability. Imagine that instead of growing at less than a half percentage point, the Portuguese economy would have continued its convergence path as in the 1990s, and have grown in the 2001 to 2010 period at 2.3%, higher than the 1.71% observed for the Euro area in the same period, but still well below what it grew in the 90s and close to what it was growing before the COVID-19 pandemic. Keeping the same debt path, this would mean that the debt over GDP ratio at the time of the Troika bailout in 2011 would have been at merely 61%, well below most economies in the Eurozone at the time. It is of course impossible to assert with certainty what would have happened but it seems very reasonable to assume that debt sustainability wouldn't have been an issue and that all the draconian austerity measures that were implemented with very high welfare costs for so many people would not have taken place. Growth does seem to solve a lot of problems, and this is one of them. Let's look now on what our model has to say concerning government debt dynamics. Before, under balanced budget, Government revenue had to equate government expenditures plus transfers. But now, we'll assume that if that is not the case, if expenses exceed revenues, 
that the government issues bonds, denoted by B underscore G. The budget constraint of the government is now changed and reflects that funds are now made available by the change in the stock of outstanding bonds, but also that interest on the previous period's stock of bonds must be paid today. All in all, we have that real purchases plus real transfers and real interest payments must be funded by tax revenues and the net change in outstanding bonds. As a side note, the concept of primary deficit or surplus is often referred to in the media. This concerns calculating the budget deficit or surplus, excluding the interest paid on debt. Note that real government saving is given by the negative of the net change in the stock of outstanding government bonds divided by the price level. Real household saving is now given by the change in capital holdings and the change in government bond holdings. When we combine both, we see that real government bonds cancel out and aggregate savings remain unchanged by an increase in public debt issuance. The change in government bonds crowds out one-to-one -one private savings. Let's look now at the impact of a deficit finance decrease in taxes. Assuming a constant expenditure path, a decrease in tax revenue will thus imply that the government budget will run a deficit. Assume now also that the government decides to restore government debt to zero from period two onwards. Then it will have to raise taxes next period equals to today's deficit, plus the amount due in interest. The net present value today of this tax change is thus zero. Hence, if the government replaces a unit of real taxes with a unit of real budget deficit, households know that the present value of next year's real taxes will rise by one unit. Thus, the real budget deficit is the same as a real tax in terms of the overall present value of real taxes, and there's no income effect on households. This finding is the simplest version of the Ricardian equivalence theorem on public debt, named after David Ricardo, notorious English economist born in the 18th century. Let's now take a look at what happens in the equilibrium business cycle model when the government cuts years one real taxes and runs a budget deficit. Economists would call this type of change a stimulative fiscal policy. Let's say that the cut in years one real taxes and the increase in future real taxes all involve lump sum taxes. These taxes have no substitution effects on consumption and labor supply. Since the cut in taxes has to be compensated by future taxes of the actually equivalent amount, there are no income effects either. Consequently, we find that in our equilibrium business cycle model, a deficit finance tax cut does not stimulate the economy. In particular, real GDP, gross investment, and the real interest rate do not change. Note, however, that some of these results rely on somewhat irrealistic assumptions. One, for example, is that households are infinitely forward-looking, even though they live finite lives. Imagine that the tax decrease leading to a budget deficit is to be financed by a tax hike in 50 years. People aged 50 and above will probably not factor in the future increase in taxes and therefore feel richer, leading to positive income effects. Other assumption is that households can borrow and lend at the same rate as the government or that they can borrow land in the first place. If a government increases taxes today and lowers them in the future, households might have a large negative income effect if they cannot borrow against a future tax relief. Estimates by economists as Greg Kaplan and Gianluca Violante have shown that up to 35% of households in the US might fall in this category, that is, that they cannot borrow against future income. What if instead of using any realistic tax instrument, such as lump sum taxes, the government decreases labor income taxes instead? Let's say that the government would lower income taxes rates today and increase them tomorrow, such that over time, just as before, the measure would be fiscally neutral. In this case, households would be led to substitute leisure between today and tomorrow, as the after-tax wage rate versus tomorrow is now smaller. In this case, a budget deficit allows the government to change the timing of labor income tax rates and therefore 
alter the timing of labor input and economic activity. However, it would not be a good idea for the government randomly to make tax rates high in some years and low in others. Since households would like to have stable profiles of consumption and leisure, using distortionary taxes leads to deadweight losses, that is, overall losses in welfare. When possible, public debt has typically been managed to maintain a pattern of reasonably stable tax rates over time. This behavior is called tax rate smoothing. When that is not possible, such as in the sovereign debt crisis in 2011, large tax hikes are usually associated with public protests and social unrest. Sometimes, though, budget deficits can be also a strategic political tool. For example, to tie the hands of the next politician coming into office, an argument analyzed by David Martimore in the early 2000s.